up to 300 pounds of explosive was packed in a car which had been parked at Banbridge in County Down. Tougher drink drive laws may be on the way as the police reveal a hard core of motorists flouted their Christmas breath test campaign. Plus a successful launch for the NASA probe which will search for water on the moon. And good morning from Amsterdam. On the last day of our whistle-stop tour around Europe to mark the beginning of Britain's EU presidency, we'll be looking at the fight against crime. And John Ketley's here with the weather. Morning, John. Good morning, Sally. And don't leave the studio without your Mac today. Some heavy downpours to come. Already some advice for motorists in the Wales and the West Country. Some heavy storms around already. Gusts to 50 or 60 miles an hour. And we'll see that being repeated in other parts of the country today as the heavier showers spread further east. John, thanks. A car bomb containing 300 pounds of explosive was made safe by security forces in Northern Ireland overnight. The vehicle was found abandoned in the town of Banbridge in County Down. There had been a telephone warning, but so far no group has officially said that it was responsible for planting the bomb. It comes at a time when tensions are high in the province. Members of the British and Irish governments are today due to meet political representatives of the loyalist paramilitaries amid fears that they are about to withdraw from the storm on peace talks. In a moment, we'll be talking to Sinn Féin's Martin McGuinness, but first, this report from our Ireland correspondent, Dennis Murray. Army experts carry out one of a series of controlled explosions on a suspect car in Banbridge in County Down. The centre of the town was cordoned off for hours as another possibly lethal incident was dealt with. This kind of thing's been part of everyday life in Northern Ireland for decades. Yet with the present ceasefires, it stands out as underlining the tense atmosphere. Last night, the Ulster Democratic Party met ahead of its meeting in London today with the Northern Ireland Secretary Mo Molum, and after it failed to get the paramilitary prisoners it represents to back its continuing involvement in the multi-party talks. Its prison spokesman, John White, summed up the mood. The people on the outside of the talks process are becoming that frustrated, but they are going to demand that we make that progress in the near future. Progress at the talks. The Irish Foreign Minister David Andrews meets the other Loyalist Party today as part of the two governments' attempts to restore stability to the negotiations. That party, the Progressive Unionists, will not be taking their seats at the talks when they resume next Monday, as things currently stand. The meetings and events of the next few days will have a major influence on the future of the peace process. Dennis Murray, BBC News, Belfast. And Martin McGuinness, Chief Negotiator for Sinn Féin, joins us now from our Londonderry studio. Good morning, Mr McGuinness. Good morning. What's your reaction, first of all, to the news overnight of this car bomb? Well, my, my reaction is to uh, redouble my efforts, and I hope the efforts of all the other people involved in the process to recognise that, that the only way forward in all of this is to get all of the parties to commit themselves to a process of genuine and meaningful uh, peace negotiations, something that we haven't had over the course of recent months. Do you condemn those who planted this bomb? Well, the, the work that I've been involved in over the course of uh, the recent while is m worth more than a million condemnations. And uh, I will continue to pursue my efforts and the efforts of Sinn Féin to bring about uh, a meaningful peace process which would result in a negotiated settlement on this island. Now, what the Loyalist prisoners are saying is that they haven't been treated fairly. They say, on, particularly on the prisons issue, that uh, Republican prisons in Britain have been moved across to Belfast and to Dublin. Republican prison prisoners in Dublin have been released early. Uh, nothing like that has happened to Loyalist prisoners. They say that is plainly unfair. Well, I agree. I believe that Loyalist uh, and Republican prisoners imprisoned uh, by, by the British government uh, should be released. And I think that they have got uh, some cause for complaint. And I hope that the British government will recognise that they too should be as imaginative as the Irish government have been in releasing prisoners prior to Christmas. I think that that would be a major benefit within the process. So, do you, said, do you, just, well, just to just make that clear, before, before you add, add what you're about to add, just, just to make that absolutely clear, so if the government makes what unionists might see, what loyalists might see as a concession to them in uh, promising perhaps uh, the earlier release of prisoners, then you for Sinn Féin would have no objection for that. Well, I mean, I've said on quite a number of interviews over the course of recent days that I was very disappointed that the British government did not take the opportunity presented by Christmas to uh, begin the release of prisoners. I think that that would have lessened uh, many of the difficulties that we're facing at the moment. But that said, I think it's very important to add that uh, the, we are not experiencing difficulties at the moment because of the refusal of the British government to release uh, loyalist uh, prisoners. The, the major reason that we are having great difficulty within the process at the moment is because 
the unionist parties and the loyalist parties are quite hostile to the process. And I think we've actually seen the situation develop over the course of uh, recent times where David Trumbull has actually lost the initiative within uh, unionism and loyalism. I believe there was a time at the beginning of the talks process when there, there was a groundswell of opinion within the unionist community supportive of unionist participation within the talks. But I think that David Trimble, because of his negativity, has surrendered all of that to the Mr Paisley's, the Mr McCartney's and the loyalist death squads on the outside. And I think it's going to be very difficult for him to get that back. Martin Guinness, thank you very much. Thank you. The long-awaited report examining whether violent videos make young people more likely to commit violent crimes is expected to be published later today. The report by researchers at the University of Birmingham was commissioned following the James Bolger murder trial in 1993. It was suggested the boy's young killers had been influenced by videos. The suggestion that this video, Child's Play 3, may have had some link with the murder of two-year-old James Bolger led the Home Office to commission this research. The findings follow a two-year study of 122 young men aged between 15 and 17 invited to view violent films. Half of those studied were young offenders, the others non-offending school and college students. And it's understood the findings show that those who already had a criminal record were more likely to enjoy and remember video violence. A history of family violence and criminal behaviour, it suggested, are necessary preconditions for developing a preference for violent films. The report is said to show that young offenders watch more videos and say violent videos are their favourites, show a slightly greater tendency to feel excited watching violence and are more likely to identify with violent characters. Actors like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone, who play violent characters, are more likely to become role models for young offenders. But the report said to provide no conclusive evidence that watching video violence actually causes crime. The research will be studied in detail by the new film censor, Andreas Whittam-Smith, in his review of whether restrictions on video violence should be tightened. Both sides in the debate are likely to find material in the report to support their case. Valerie Jones, BBC News. The hardcore of people continued to drink and drive over Christmas, according to the police. The final figures for those who failed breath tests in England and Wales over the festive period are due to be released today. Some forces have already expressed disappointment at the statistics. When did you last have an alcoholic drink? The Christmas and New Year drink-drive figures will be less clear-cut than previous years. Some police forces will, as usual, reveal the total number of positive breath tests taken over a period of two weeks. But some forces will only reveal the number of drivers testing positive after accidents. If you take a deep breath, blow until I tell you to stop. But the clear picture that is emerging is of a hard core of offenders who consistently ignore anti-drink drive campaigns. As a result, the government may consider reducing the current limit of 80 milligrams of alcohol per 100 millilitres of blood to just 50 milligrams. Vivian McNaughton is an inner London senior probation officer who runs courses for those convicted of being up to three and a half times over the legal drink drive limit. The legal limit should be lowered because I think there is evidence to show that people's driving is impaired at, at the level that we have at present and there's some evidence that reducing the level in other countries has reduced the level of accidents. But one of the country's largest motoring organisations says a more effective method of targeting offenders is needed. The talk about changing the limits is really a bit of a distraction. If we look at the figures, the majority of people caught drinking and driving are more than twice over the limit. So really, it is up to the police to target them more. Target where they drink, target pubs and clubs. The government is expected to produce a consultation document on all aspects of drink drive policy. One idea is a two-tier penalty system, where drivers who exceed a lower limit are given lighter punishments. But ministers are keen to stress this is just one of a number of options. Kerry Johnston, BBC News. Superintendent Mike McCormack of the Norfolk Police is in our Norwich studio. He joins me now. Good morning to you. Good morning. How did it go in your area? I'm afraid it didn't go very well for us. We arrested more drivers this year than, than we've ever done in the past. 
Does that mean more offenders or, uh, or better policing? I think it means that, that we've refined the processes by which we actually look for drunk drivers. Um, as we've just heard on the news clip there, we actually uh, look for the drivers uh, and move into the areas where we believe drink drivers are, are driving their vehicles. Now that's one of the options that was uh, suggested there by the RAC, that there should be more targeting of these hardcore drivers. Do you agree that that's the, the way the policy should be going now? I think it is, yes. It's something we've employed for the last few years in that we've stopped, um, just say, a, for, for use of a better phrase, randomly breath testing drivers. We now target the areas, target the drivers themselves. We look at the information that we've had over previous months. We use a hotline, a drink drive hotline, and we're actually looking for the hardcore of drink drivers now. There was a, a suggestion indeed in, in Scotland where there was a heavy crackdown uh, in many areas, like Strathclyde, for instance, rumblings among people that, in fact, random testing was using up police resources that could be better spent, perhaps, in more productive crime areas. Do you think that, that targeting in this way would actually reduce that problem? I think, yes, it, it would reduce the, the problem that you've just mentioned there, in that if you actually target the area, you're actually directing the resources, you utilise them in a much more efficient way and an effective way. And at the end of the day, the results you come out with uh, are better results. Another option being suggested is actually lowering the le legal limit. What do you think of that? I think one of the problems at the moment is that the motorist goes out and, and he or she thinks that they can drink a certain amount of alcohol. The message from us is quite clear. Even one small drink will impair your driving ability. Therefore, if you lower the limit, the, the message is clear and simple. It must be none for the road. But these, these hardcore offenders, of course, are often, in many cases, twice the limit already. I mean, these aren't people who are just making a wee mistake. They're people who are, are ignoring any limit. I mean, do, do you not end up, in that case, penalising your careful, law-abiding drinkers at, at the expense of those who don't care two hoots anyway? Not, not really. I, I think the majority of motorists realise the, the message that we're trying to get across and they do try to abide by the, the law. But the hardcore, the, um, the, the element that we've been looking at this Christmas, um, wh whatever you tell them, whatever message you give across, they will ignore you. And that's why we need to target the hardcore. And if you reduce the limits, then what you're saying to this hardcore is there is no excuse now. You must not drink and drive. Superintendent McCormick, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. London Council is expected to be seriously criticised for its handling of a paedophile scandal involving one of its social workers. An independent inquiry is expected to accuse the Labour-controlled Hackney Council of mismanagement and organisational incompetence over the way it dealt with sex abuse allegations against Mark Trotter. He died from an AIDS-related illness in 1995 after a career in which he came into contact with more than 300 children. Reducing air pollution will be one of the top priorities of the British government during its six-month presidency of the European Union. Ministers will give details today of their plans, which are expected to focus on traffic pollution. They're expected to press for tougher exhaust emission controls throughout the EU and try to persuade people to use public transport. More than 100 dolphins have been found dead on a beach in Venezuela. They swam ashore on an island north of the capital, Caracas. One theory is that disease might have impaired their ability to navigate. Mass beachings of this kind are not uncommon, but this is said to be one of the biggest ever recorded. Every education authority in England will today be given government targets for improving literacy amongst 11-year-olds. It's the first time each part of the country has been told how many children it must educate to a certain level. Some authorities will be expected to get 90% of children to the required levels within five years, while even the lowest scoring areas must get to 70%. The Americans have launched their first mission to the moon for 25 years. The unmanned space probe Lunar Explorer blasted off from Cape Canaveral in Florida in the early hours of this morning. Its builders proudly boast that Lunar Prospector is a trailblazer that cost less than a Hollywood blockbuster. Five, four, three, two, one. Zero and liftoff of the Athena 2 rocket and the Lunar Prospector spacecraft on a voyage to rediscover the moon. The moon probe was fired straight up into the air on top of a new type of booster rocket. Flight controllers watched anxiously as it climbed high above Florida on a trajectory that would send it directly to the moon. Going through the sound barrier, period of 
Dynamic pressure. And there is our separation, first aid separation. The rocket passed over Africa and the Indian Ocean before its engines fired one last time high above Western Australia. It will go into orbit around the moon on Sunday and begin mapping the surface in more detail than ever before. Lunar Prospector will search for ice on the moon. If it finds it, some experts think the discovery will open up the solar system for human exploration using lunar water to fuel the rocket ships of the future. Leo Enright, BBC News. It is uh, quarter past seven, still to come in the uh, next hour or so. Killings continue in Algeria. What, if anything, can Britain do to stop them? And the Dutch approach to soft drugs upsets EU neighbours. But is their relaxed attitude the shape of the future? Now, all this week we've been reporting from Europe on the issues that Britain wants to concentrate on during the next six months as we preside over the European Union. Today we're looking at crime and uh, Sophie is in Amsterdam. Sophie, good morning. Good morning, Justin, from this rather windy city. I'm here on the canals of Amsterdam, which is so famous for the two businesses guaranteed to attract criminals, sex and drugs. The fight against crime is certainly one of the priorities over the next six months and Tony Blair is hoping that greater cooperation between the Euro forces will help clamp down on organised crime. But as Mike Duncan reports, that's going to be no easy task. On patrol with Dutch police in Amsterdam's red light district. Organised crime feeds best off sex and drugs. And there's plenty in this city to satisfy the most voracious of appetites. Amsterdam is the main conduit for the traffic in women, which the European Union has pledged to stop. Women from the world over. Different countries, uh, Holland, uh, Holland uh, South America, uh, Thailand, uh, now Eastern Europe. But the uh, Eastern uh, girls are mostly this side of, of the street. All around here, only sex and drugs. So there's big money in it? Yes. Very big. Very big money. But it's a trade it's incredibly hard for the authorities to clamp down on. Those who run it are never usually to be found on the streets. And checks on papers are most often a perfunctory exercise. The women themselves, recruited back home for a job in the West, are too fearful to complain when they discover what that job is. And the Dutch group, which campaigns for the rights of foreign women forced into the sex trade, says if they do contact police to complain, they're usually deported without an investigation. The EU must change that. So the first thing that should be changed in the policies of the European countries is to create the conditions for women to come out, to ask for support, to escape, to press charges, which means they should be allowed a temporary staying permit, they should have witness protection, and they should have appropriate support. When it comes to drugs, Dutch police have got tough lately. After a series of high-profile raids, two drugs barons currently await trial. But heroin and cocaine continue to flow unabated through Holland to the rest of Europe and beyond. At an Amsterdam drug addiction centre, the real cost of this billion pound trade is measured out daily. Yeah. Harold takes methadone, a heroin substitute, to try and break a 12-year cycle of abuse. All his previous efforts were thwarted by the drug's pushers. Well, they are always trying to sell you drugs again. Those people are making very good money out uh, from uh, the drugs. When I'm surrounded uh, uh, with people who are making a profit out of uh, people's life selling the dope. I don't like the idea at all. And as new, more fashionable drugs hit the market, the profits expand. At dance parties in Holland, ecstasy tablets are accepted as a norm. They even test them for purity at club venues. Experts have concluded that attempting a total clampdown on drug trafficking can be counterproductive. The tougher the measures you, you take, the 
the more interesting it becomes for some people to bring it in because um, prices get higher and with higher prices you always find people who uh, find it very attractive to, uh, to bring it in. Getting a grip on organized crime in the cities of Europe seems like wishful thinking. As international borders open up, the criminals can ply their trade more easily and faster. The British government believes that there's only one way the people can fight back, by knowing exactly how the enemy works. Behind the walls of what was Gestapo headquarters in Holland is Europe's secret weapon. Europol will this year bring together 300 officers from each EU state and preventing cross-border crime will top their agenda. Nine days for the, for the drugs. Nine days uh, for the drugs. Trafficking. Projects. And other, other. But don't expect a miracle, Europe's police chief warns. We will not uh, win in a way that uh, at the end there's no more crime. But I think that we can have it in a balance that uh, crime will not take over our society, our economy. So there will be always crime in the future, that's for sure. And uh, again, police alone, customs authorities alone cannot do the job. We need a common approach by all the society, by all our states. A people's Europe cannot be a Europe without victims. But the closest cooperation must be backed by political muscle to keep Europe's underworld at bay. Well, I'm joined here in Amsterdam by David Vals Russell, who is from Europol, and Rule Kersenmacher, who is a drugs prevention specialist. Good morning to you both. Good morning. David Vals Russell, how can we have a common approach when we're in a city here like, like um, Amsterdam, where they have a very different approach to drugs than we do perhaps in Britain or many other countries across the rest of the European Union? How can we have a common approach? In fact, we do have a very common approach on tackling organized crime, and that is what the European Union are very concerned about that is what Europol is there to deal with. We have a common view about the importance of dealing with organized crime. It, whether the uh, criminals concerned are handling drugs or the unfortunate women we saw in your earlier clip uh, in forced prostitution and so on, then there is a major problem that needs to be tackled. There's a common will to do it. There are differences, of course, in uh, mutual recognition of procedures and various aspects to be ironed out. But uh, with Europol, with the cooperation of the member states' law enforcement agencies, we are dealing with the problem. But you must feel that if you clamp down on drugs, then a lot of the problems would be solved. You would be at least targeting organised crime. Well, we are targeting organised crime. And the whole approach, which is uh, becoming very uh, well established in the UK, of intelligence-led policing, when you focus on the organisation and the criminal, is actually the way to deal with the problem. And what happens at street level by then it's almost too late. So you've got to get in at a high level in the organization and on that there is total unanimity in the European Union of where you should, we should go. Well, Kersenmacher, what would happen if, if you were to clamp down completely on drugs here? What effect would that have? Well, probably on the street level that would have some consequences for, uh, for, for the coffee shops, for example. And I think the Netherlands would be uh, very reluctant to give up uh, the coffee shop policy because we think that um, uh, selling cannabis in the open, uh, controlled by the police, is much better than do that in an underground, uh, in an underground way. And uh, the coffee shop policy, it has some positive effects, um, because the people who come there don't come into contact with hard drugs, they only come into contact with soft drugs over there, and that has some positive effects on the use of hard drugs. Do you feel under pressure now from the European Union, though, and this pulling together and perhaps of police forces? Do you think that there may be pressure on you to change your policies? Well, there is some pressure, but uh, on the other hand, um, I hope we can convince uh, the other members of the European Union that this coffee shop policy, um, well, it has some grounds and there are some positive effects. And, um, um, so um, I think if, if this policy has no consequences um, for other countries, then I think we, uh, we can continue with this, uh, with this uh, coffee shop policy. How effective is Europol going to be? I mean, it isn't actually in existence yet, really, is it, in theory? Our liaison officers, supportive analysts, are already helping member states deal with the exchange of information between each other. So already they are contributing enormously. Last year we dealt with 2,500 cases on behalf of the EU. But from next year, when, will we, when we will be able to study problems in depth and offer intelligence of our own initiative to member states, it will make a huge difference and build on the excellent work that's already going on. And let me make the point that in the Netherlands, for example, uh, there has been superb cooperation in dealing with uh, 
major cocaine smuggling case recently involving the UK. They've set up uh, a national team to deal with ecstasy and the problems there. So there is a serious commitment in all the member states to enforcement uh, at certainly at the dealing level. OK, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you both very much for joining us. Thank and you. it's now time to go back from the canals of Amsterdam to London and Sally. Thanks, Sophie. Sophie, looking at my... surprised at just how far the new Mitsubishi Pajero will take you. Hi! So, how about a ride? The all-terrain vehicle that redefines freedom. Petit coup d'œil dans le rétroviseur avec le Dakar 1983, la cinquième édition du Paris-Dakar. Une violente tempête de sable va provoquer cette année-là l'annulation de plusieurs spéciales. Au total, trois jours de course seront supprimés. Quelques temps avant le départ, Hubert Oriol était encore plâtré. Il avait le bras dans le plat à la suite d'un accident survenu lors des reconnaissances avec le team BMW. Et il y avait plusieurs femmes aussi dans ce Dakar, dans ce cinquième Dakar. Hey, on a comme des bulles. Christine Martin. Enfin, est arrivé de jour. Et là, c'est le principal. On est là, on est content. engagés dans cette cinquième édition du Dakar. 353, 253 pardon, autos et camions et 132 motos. Moto, ils seront 123 à l'arrivée, toutes catégories confondues. Et plusieurs femmes avaient été engagées dans ce Dakar, à l'image de Christine Martin. On se souvient de Nicole Métro, de Marie Artaud et de la hollandaise Anne Cries. Et puis en catégorie auto, les frères Marot. Claude et Bernard, après avoir réussi leur épopée en 4 4 en Renault, en Renault 4 pardon, et en Renault 20, avaient pris une Renault 18. Victoire de Jackie X en auto et d'Hubert Oriol en moto. Demain, le rallye va quitter le Maroc et va rentrer en Mauritanie. Smara Zouerat au programme 614 km avec 494 de spécial sur une piste qui reliait jadis le Maroc à Tombouctou. Entrée en Mauritanie avec les premières pistes, la navigation et les dunes. Une forme de mise en jambe avant la grande étape du marathon de lendemain. Je vous donne donc rendez-vous demain soir à, sur Eurosport, toujours à 22h30. Bonne soirée à tous, au revoir. Paris-Dakar avec Euromaster, le spécialiste européen du pneu et Mitsubishi Motors Corporation.
Salut, voici le programme de ce premier Rogol de l'année. Champion d'automne depuis la défaite du Real au Bétis, Barcelone et traîne ce lundi son titre honorifique à Salamanque. C'est la trêve en Allemagne, Marc Keller mais aussi Bichente Lissarasu compareront le championnat d'Allemagne avec celui de la France. L'Allemagne figurera parmi les favoris du prochain mondial, nous verrons les forces de la Mannschaft. Klinsmann, Lama, Carambe, Dugarry ont profité du mercato d'hiver pour changer d'horizon. Rémi Tissier fera un point sur les plus gros transferts de cet hiver. La Coupe de la Ligue en France, 16e de finale, pas de problème pour Marseille et Auxerre. Enfin le championnat du Portugal, les Porto qui dominent après une nouvelle victoire face à Benfica 2-0. Le déplacement à Villamarine s'annonçait comme très difficile pour le Real de Madrid, d'autant que les Madrilènes restent sur des sorties peu convaincantes à l'extérieur. À chaque fois, ils ont été tenus en échec et le Bétis de Séville profite de la fébrilité de la défense pour se procurer les premières occasions. Fini dit à chipper le ballon à Roberto Carlos, il l'a donné à Alfonso qui a mis sa tête au-dessus. Onzième minute, ça continue avec Marquez. Marquez à centre au deuxième poteau. Le croate Jarni reprend, une balle qui lobe Canizares, qui a rebondi au sol. Et c'est le premier but de la partie pour le Bétis de Séville. C'est le troisième but de la saison pour le croate Robert Jarni. Mais les Madrilènes n'ont pas l'intention de se laisser décrocher. Coup prend de Hierro. Deux Madrilènes se précipitent. Souker et Raoul, mais d'un cheveu, il manque que leur reprise de la tête. Le Real pousse pour revenir, ce qui oblige Luis Aragonés à venir au bord du terrain pour remplacer notamment Marquez. Le coach du Betis a bien senti que le danger venait du côté droit. Roberto Carlos réussit le 1-2 parfait et vient tromper Prats à 5,50 m. Premier but de Roberto Carlos dans ce championnat 97-98. Le Real égalise. Les spectateurs de Villamarine sont à peine assis à leur place que la deuxième mi-temps débute avec l'offensive de Jarni qui sent tête Alfonso sur la transversale. Oli est là pour reprendre ce ballon qui lui rebondit dans les pieds. Et deux buts à pour le Bétis. Oli ajoute un sixième but à son capital. Il devient ainsi le meilleur buteur du club. 4 minutes plus tard, les hommes d'Icons obtiennent un corner. Souker le frappe tête au premier poteau de Raoul. Mais Marquez a sauvé. Ça revient sur Raoul grâce à une tête de Guti qui trompe Prats pour la deuxième fois de la soirée. Raoul inscrit son huitième but de la saison. Il rejoint en tête des buteurs dans le club madrilène Morientes. Mais cette égalisation ne durera que 11 minutes juste après l'heure de jeu. C'est Yugoslav Vidakovic qui n'avait pas marqué depuis la première journée qui va donner la victoire aux bêtises de Séville. Grâce à cette frappe aux 18 mètres, Canizares ne peut rien faire sur la volée. Et ce 1-2 de, de Holly, deuxième but de la saison pour Vidakovic. Le Bétis mène alors 3 buts à 2. Aiken se lance à ce moment-là. Savio venu du Brésil. Savio qui comprend que le championnat espagnol est aussi brutal parfois que le championnat brésilien. Roberto Carlos essaye de trouver ce cas, il le trouve, mais intervention de Prats qui sauve son équipe dans les toutes dernières minutes de jeu. D'abord ce cœur qui échoue et là Nadj lui n'échoue pas sur la cheville de Sanchez et il reçoit fort logiquement un carton rouge de M. Brito Arceo en fin de rencontre. Le Real de Madrid s'incline et laisse le Barça en tête de la Liga, quoi qu'il arrive ce lundi à Salamanque pour les Catalans. La Real Sociedad, troisième de la Liga, fait débuter ce week-end Igor Svitanovic, venu du Croatia Zagreb, un renfort de choix. Ce cela n'empêche pas les promus de Mallorca de se créer la première occasion avec Alves, mais Alberto est bien présent pour mettre ce ballon en corner. La Sociedad n'est pas en reste avec De Pedro qui frappe, une frappe qui est boxée en corner par le gardien de Mallorca, Roa. Poussé par son nombre public, les Basques dominent à présent leur adversaire d'un soir. Et un centre de De Pedro qui revient dans les pieds, qui est contré. C'est une situation des plus confuses. 
Mais ça revient une nouvelle fois sur De Pedro qui frappe à 30 mètres, le ballon est dévié. Roi ne peut rien faire, il est battu pour la première fois de la soirée. La Real Sociedad ouvre le score à la 25 e minute. C'est son deuxième but personnel à De Pedro depuis le début du championnat. Une nouvelle fois De Pedro pour ce coup franc et c'est une tête de Kovacevic au deuxième poteau. Il était venu couper la trajectoire, le Yougoslave, mais ça passe à côté des buts de Roa. Tentative à présent de Mayor, toujours mené à 0 avec Stankovic, mais une frappe complètement loupée. Et la Real Sociedad continue sur sa lancée, 15e match sans défaite pour les Basques de la Real. L'Atlético de Madrid est déjà à 10 points du Barça et n'a pas le droit à l'erreur en recevant Santander qui occupe la 12e place du classement. Mais le Racing n'est pas venu à Vicente Calderon en victime expiatoire. Ce sont eux qui se créent la première occasion. Heureusement, le poteau droit de Molina le supplée sur cette frappe de Correa. Toujours Santander à l'attaque. Correa, on va le retrouver. Il va effectuer un petit festival sur le côté droit. Il repique vers le centre, il frappe, mais cette fois-ci Molina est impeccable. Et il intervient devant l'attaque de Santander. Il faut attendre la 42e minute et ce 1-2 entre Juninho et Vieri pour voir les Madrilènes réagir et marquer le premier but de la partie. Christian Vieri est revenu après blessure et l'Italien marque son 9e but de la saison. Son compteur était resté bloqué en raison de sa blessure. Il avait fait très fort en début de championnat avec 8 buts. Le voici donc maintenant à 9. Appel revenu des vestiaires, l'Atletico va doubler la marque avec cette frappe signée Aguilera qui trompe Sebalos, un ballon qui va entre les jambes du portier de Santander, une 2 avec Kiko. C'est son deuxième but depuis le début de la saison, et on s'aperçoit rapidement que les shorts de l'Atletico ne sont pas véritablement solides, puisque José Marie est obligé de changer de short après cet accrochage avec Correa. À un quart d'heure de la fin, Santander réduit le score sur ce corner. Ballon qui arrive dans la surface de réparation. C'est dévié au premier poteau par Diego Lopez. Une frappe de Merino qui avait bien contrôlé de la poitrine. Il se met en position de frappe et il dévisse complètement sa reprise. Mais sur la trajectoire, il y a Diego Lopez pour marquer et ramener le score à 2 buts 1. 